into and allowed me to be mentored under ended up being uh, a 35 year career which ended up actually me being the president of a small biopharmaceutical company but also um, being in charge of uh, antivirals namely HIV drugs for Glaxo uh, on a worldwide basis so um, I guess the message to the students today is couple of things. One is there are fabulous careers in this particular area. Uh, and the second thing is that um, they are careers, they're pathways. You can make it a lifetime career. I think I'm evidence of that. And then the other thing that I wanted to say is that um, this, this particular area is very portable. So you can actually do this kind of work out of your residence. You don't necessarily have to be in a major metropolis. Uh, it's, it's very exciting that way. So that's enough about me, enough about uh, my career. Now I want to introduce our guest today. And um, I'm going to start with Alexis. Alexis has an MS and an MBA. She's a director at Clinical Inc. Uh, she is the director of study operations. Um, she did counselor education at UNCG and an MBA from Wake Forest. She has an experience in, she has experience in development and preclinical and clinical testing of uh, psychopharmacal interventions and medical devices. She has managed preclinical and clinical projects and over $17 million in funding from NIH and the Department of Defense and BARDA. Thank you, Alexis, for coming. Doug Pierce is the president of Clinical Inc. Doug, Doug has more than 20 years of experience in digital forms of technology, mobile data capture, healthcare workforce solutions, and application design. Mr. Pierce co-founded Clinical Inc. in 2007, which if you do the math, that's 12 years ago, to revolutionize clinical trials by eliminating the complexities and costs associated with paper-based data capture processes. In his, in his role as president at Clinical Inc., uh, Doug leads the strategic direction, development, and evolution of Clinical Inc.'s e-source uh, platform. So as a young clinical research associate, uh, way back in my early days, I just remember endless amounts of paper and endless amounts of signing and countersigning of clinical forms. Each patient would have a form, but each patient would have many visits and studies would last six to nine months sometimes. And so the paper base became unbelievable. So when I heard what Doug and Alexis were doing, I was just so ecstatic and so excited. So without further ado, please welcome. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Russ. Russ, thank you very much. John, am I going to mess you up if I walk around the stage? Beautiful. Um, I have a hard time talking, standing still. Um, we started Clinical Week to revolutionize clinical trial. The revolution has not occurred yet, uh, but we, build it, we feel it building. Revolutions take a long time. We're going to talk about innovation in the clinical research market. Um, and we're going to talk about from um, a kind of historical point of view first. And then Alexis is going to talk about it from a clinical ink point of, point of view. And um, we figured it'd be a better presentation if we talked to you about what we, what we know rather than keep. About these things. We're going to talk about the difference between innovation and invention. We're going to talk about three drivers of change. Significant prob prob problems, presence of an MVP or a minimally viable pro product, and supportive market or, and or regulations. Then we're going to turn, oddly enough, uh, to look at the evolution between horses and automobiles. And probably none of you expected to hear me talk about horses and cars. But you're probably secretly hoping I would, and I am. And then we're going to turn to actually innovation in the clinical research market itself. So let's talk about innovation versus invention. Um, my office, our office, is in the innovation quarter. Um, if I stopped anyone there and said, what's the difference between innovation and invention, I'd probably get a lot of different uh, responses. So innovate and invent both are they come to us from Latin. And innovate means to bring something new in. So it's in plus novus, which means new. So when you innovate something, you're bringing something new into what you already do. So innovation is about changing process, changing the way we typically do 
do things. Invention, literally, in the Latin means to discover or uncover something brand new. And we tend to think about that in terms of making things. I invent something. And innovations often are driven by these things. Okay? But inventions do not always lead to innovations. And there's lots of um, great examples of inventions that did not lead to innovations. I'm using one from uh, the history of personal computing that may or may not speak to you, but nonetheless, um, this is a computer that was built in 1979 by Xerox at Xerox Park. Park stands for the Palo Alto Research Center. And it was the absolute epicenter of computer science and computer, computer inventions in its day. Absolutely amazing stuff. And they invented a lot of really cool technology. And they did nothing with it. And in 1979, a 20-some-year-old kid named Steve Jobs is walking through Xerox Park, and he sees this machine. This machine had what we all call uh, a pointer, ah, a mouse. No one had ever seen a mouse before, ever. It had this thing here, which is like a cord, like, like an organ cord, and you can enter data with three or four fingers at once. It had a, what's called a graphical user inter interface. Blew Steve Jobs away, and he said, what are you guys doing with this invention? And they said, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just, they, they, they just made it. And Jobs said, yeah, okay. And he leaves, and a few years later, he comes up with this, the Macintosh, 1984. And the Macintosh is an, an innovation. It's based on some inventions, but Xerox had much of what we had here, graphical user interface, a mouse, one piece, but Xerox did nothing with it. They had an invention, but they didn't know how to take that something new and bring it into what they're doing. They didn't think, how can a new type of computing change the way people like us use computers? Not computer sci scientists, people like us. Okay? So keep in mind, when we're talking about innovation, we're not just talking about inventions. The clinical research market has got plenty of inventions, uh, discoveries, new drugs, but um, Clinical Inc. is really focused on innovation. So, um, Steve Jobs, again, saying if Xerox had known what they had, uh, they would have ruled the world. Innovation is a product of a company's culture, not its intellectual property. Innovation is a mindset. Innovation is a way of understanding the world. Innovation is a way of understanding a sustainable opportunity. It's big. It's important. Expensive. It matters. I've been in the office once. Card on a phone, and he was really excited about it. And I was trying to, you know, share his enthusiasm. And I finally said to him, "What problem are you solving?" And uh, he said, "You know, the the hassle of handing someone your business card." And I'm saying, "So you're going like, to beam it to them, or you know, email it?" And, and the more we talked about it, what he came to see was there was no problem here. Paper business cards work just fine. I had this morning three people give me, give me the, their cards. I said, thanks. I went back to my office. It took zero time. There isn't a problem. His technology was cool. His invention was cool. No problem to solve. Now, the next thing is you got to have a product or a solution that is minimally vi viable. What does minimally viable mean? It means it's good enough. It's not perfect, but it's got to be good enough to address this important opportunity. And finally, you've got to have supportive regulations or a market. In other words, if what you invent, what you make, your innovation is against the law, it's not going to work. If there's no regulations around it, it's not going to work. So these are the three things you've got to have in clinical re research and I would say anywhere else. You've got to have a problem that people care about. It's important. 
it's serious, it's expensive. You gotta have a minimally viable solution and then you gotta have a market and regulations that support the uh, change itself. So, to talk about that in a different point of view, wildly different point of view, let's talk about the transition from horsepower to automobile power. And prior to the computing revolution, it's, it's one of the biggest revolutionary changes in the history of humankind. It's huge. Okay, so I'm going to run through some key, some key dates, and then I'm going to turn to um, what drove the change from horses to automobiles, and it's not what you think. Okay, so the first date, 1519, Cortez brings horses to North Ameri America. It's hard to imagine the impact that horses had. Imagine never seeing a horse in your life and seeing these guys riding on top of these large animals encased in armor, right? And here you are pulling carts by hand. It was human carts. And you know, the, Az the Aztecs had their famous, like, we call it the mail system of the Az Aztecs. Who knows what the mail system of the Aztec consisted of? People running from point A to point B, then another guy running from point B to point B. Just people running through the jungles, right? Imagine you're one of those Aztec runners and a guy rides by on a horse. I mean, radical change, huge change. And quickly, the number of horses just expands, huge. And by 1884, there's over 150,000 horses in New York City alone, millions across the United States and the world. In 1885, someone invents what was called the horseless carriage, 1885. Oddly, tragically, of course, in 1899, Henry Bliss was killed in New York City, first American, maybe the first guy in the world, to be killed by an automobile, um, run over by an electric taxi. A Tesla just runs him down in New York City. The story is he was getting off of a streetcar and helping his lady friend down and didn't hear the taxi coming. And it literally just ran him down, right? If he'd remembered his manners, ladies first, uh, he maybe would have been alive. Uh, but in any case, he's run down, killed by an electric taxi, okay? By 1900, there are over 4,000 cars uh, in the United States. By 1912, that number jumps to 365,000. We go from 4,000 to 365,000 cars. By 1950, half a million up. By 2012, we've got that. I just checked this morning, over a billion cars now. Over a billion, okay? Now, that's a dramatic change in a very short time. And the, the, the mistake we make in thinking about what drove this change is we think that what drove the change was just the invention of the automobile. That everyone was walking around with their horses thinking, ah, I hate these horses. You know, they're such a pain. If only they were something better, and when the first car, they go, thank goodness, I can get rid of, you know, old Betsy here and get a car. That is not the case, though. So, what is, what were the problems driving the, the move from uh, horsepower to automobile power? Um, the problem that we talked about at the core of innovation can either be a direct problem or can be what we call an indirect problem. And economists like to refer to indirect problems as negative externalities. Okay, so there's lots of things that have negative externalities. And for, again, from an economic point of view, a negative externality is a cost we pay because of something. It, the thing itself may work great, but we pay this cost, and it's called a negative externality. And I'm going to get to the negative externalities of horses here in a second. But the point is, what really drove the move from horsepower to automobile power was, in fact, a negative externality. Now, to understand the, the negative externality of horses, you don't look here. This is a beautiful horse. This, this is the kind of thing that everyone loves. People who own horses love horses. To understand the negative externality of horses, you got to look here. Okay? This is the end of the horse that 
produces, so to speak, the negative externalities. What do I mean by that? The great manure crisis of 1894. This is a real thing. You can look it up. This was a real thing. The great manure crisis of 1894. In New York City alone, this is a global crisis, but in New York City alone, there are over 150,000 horses in the streets. They produce over 550,000 tons of manure a year. That is a lot of manure, okay? The predictions were that if, if a solution wasn't found, the manure would, would reach the third floor all through New York City. There were mountains and mountains and mountains of manure. At first, they carted it out of the city and sold it to farmers. But pretty soon, every farmer had enough manure. Thank you very, very much. So then they just started piling it up. So outside of New York City were mountains of manure. Mountains of manure. Um, filthy streets. There are mud, mud bogs. This is a New York City street, and that's not just mud, okay? Imagine making your way down that street. Imagine cleaning that street. Imagine that street when it rains. Imagine that street this morning, okay? Brutal. Um, dead horses. On average, 41 horses died in New York City every day. Now, picture 41 dead horses around New York City. I mean, what do you do with them? You get other horses to go and you know, hoist them up, put them on a wagon. There's so many dead horses. Look at this photograph. If you have children, imagine how your children would react if they were standing around a dead horse. I mean, these kids aren't even looking at it. They're just sitting there. They're not poking it. I mean, nothing. They're so used to seeing dead horses, it doesn't even interest them. Okay? Huge problem. There was so much manure in the streets that... Children were employed as what was called uh, crossing sweeps. And when ladies would come up for a tip, the kids would sweep a path through the manure to let the ladies walk across the road. Okay? It was insane. And this machine here was invented to try to clean up the streets. As the horse goes, they're cleaning up. Now, in 1898, as the cities around the world literally filled with manure... There was a, a, a meeting in New York called the Urban Planners Meeting. It was scheduled for 10 days, and the only topic was, what are we going to do about all this horse manure? And after three days, they just gave up and said, shh. They probably said, shit. Uh, we don't have any, any, any this, isn't, this isn't going to work. You know, we have no solution here to the mountains of manure that are plaguing our cities. Okay. That is a serious negative externality. No problem with horses, per se. People liked their horses. Horses worked fine. Horses were plenty strong enough to pull the wagons and, and, and lift whatever they were doing. They worked great. The problem was behind them. So, how do we solve it? We've got a big problem, right? Well, we need a minimally viable alternative to horses. This ain't it. 1885, that's never going to replace anything, okay? That's awful. But look what happens in 1912. That's a pretty good car. I mean, I'd drive that car. I mean, we all would drive that car. That's not like that first thing we got. It's like, wh what is it? This is a real car. This is an MVP. Big problem. And the technology grows and grows. Why is the, te why is the technology growing? Because we've got a problem to solve. We got this big, big, important, potentially valuable problem to solve. Now, the last thing we need is a large market, which we have, millions of horses, and a supportive environment. We need an environment that would support this new technology, the new coming into the old. So, at the beginning, there were no rules at all. Look at this photograph here. I mean, it's crazy. There are people walking, there are people on bicycles, there are people on horses, people on carriages, there are people in, on, on uh, trolley cars, going everywhere. No lines, no right way, no wrong way, you know, nothing. Look at this picture here. It's even worse. And there's just people like wandering around the, the streets. This is why people are getting killed by horses and soon to be cars. But eventually, what, and, and not the, the roads weren't, weren't the best, Imagine trying to sell cars when these were your roads, okay? But eventually, 
things began happening. We began to think about things like maybe we should have like stop signs and, and have two-way roads and one-way roads and um, all these other regs that we're used to having that makes automobiles possible. It makes it work. What is the big problem with electric cars now? Is, you know, with the exception of a uh, Tesla, where do you charge them? Well, in the early days of the internal combustion engine cars, the big problem was where do you get gas? You know, so you had to have an, you, you, you had to have a supportive infrastructure in place before this, this all works. So you got a problem, massive problem. You've got an MVP, and you eventually have a market and supporting regulations, and that allows you to, in, to innovate. Those are the three things that we have to have. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to take this idea of what drives innovation and, and the kind of use case we looked at was the uh, revolution that occurred when we moved from horses to automobiles. And Alexis is going to take that same kind of frame, framework and talk about this in the context of clinical re research and especially uh, the Clinical Inc.'s uh, perspective on it. Thanks, Doug. You're welcome. Uh -huh. So I am going to first talk about the Clinical Inc. and sort of how we came up with the eSource um, as well as our um, ECOA technology. Um, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the other potential renovation or innovations in clinical research. Um, so let's look at taking our horse and carriage, the automobile, um, to clinical research. So what is really driving innovation in the clinical research market? we have very big, very expensive, and very important problems. There are lives at stake every day. Um, we have MVPs and MVSs, right? So there are minimally viable products as well as minimally viable solutions. Um, we have a huge market um, with fairly supportive regulations. Um, so we're gonna focus first on data capture and then we'll move on um, to some other examples. So when we think about electronic data capture, we're talking specifically about moving from paper to electronic data capture in clinical trials. Um, so this is what you might encounter if you are in a typical clinical trial um, previously and actually still in some of the clinical trials um, I have actually monitored in um, this very room before um, in a clinical trial. So you have these huge things of paper, um, you are collecting literally everything you can think of about um, your patients who are in your clinical trial in this folder, and it is the Bible, you gotta keep it, everything's gotta be written down, you have to have very specific ways that you write down and cross out, um, et cetera. And then you spend another 20% of your day taking all of that stuff from paper and putting it into a computer. Um, and then you have this monitor who comes in and sits in one of these very small rooms in your clinical research site, and they go through all the data that you wrote down and make sure that what you wrote down is what you actually put into the computer. And if you didn't, then they put these sticky notes, which you actually see sticking out of these things. Sorry, there we go. Sticky notes sticking out of these things, telling you, no, you actually got this wrong. You need to go back and look at this. Oh, you forgot a signature. You didn't fill out this information. Did you write it down somewhere else? Can we get it? If, did you miss it? Did we lose data? Um, so there's all of these things that are happening, making clinical trials even more expensive than they already are. And to top it off, once you have all of that paper, then you got to store it for like four, five, 15 years, depending on regulations. <clears throat> so really, if we think about it, we've got this paper source that we're putting into an electronic database, which is very similar to a horse pulling along a um, car. It doesn't really make sense for us. So really, paper data capture is to clinical research what horses were to urban transportation. So paper works pretty well. We've been using it for a long time. What's really that problem? So it takes 10 to 12 years and about two to three billion dollars to take a drug from discovery to market. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Half of clinical research sites fail to enroll a single subject. Um, I have a clinical trial from my previous job that has been going on for a year and a half and it has two patients. 50% um, of researchers do one clinical trial and then they're done with it because it is way too much hassle. 20% of our study nurses, that person that you saw working on that computer, spend their day working on that computer. 
17% of subjects drop out because you're sitting there with all that stupid paper filling everything out and you have to come in for everything, every visit, every single thing you have to do. And 20% of our auditors who go in and monitor drop out because sitting and checking paper against something that's in a computer is, to be quite honest with you guys, not that much fun. Um, and I can say that from experience. And as a result, we spend about $10 billion a year on monitoring activities. So it's big, it's expensive, and it's an important problem. So really what we looked at was, is there a way to have technology that enables direct data entry? So you have a patient, doesn't matter where they are, you don't have paper in front of you, you're just putting it directly into that computer. So in 1983, the first tablet came out, which is not an MVP. It's not high enough technology for us to be able to use for this purpose. But in 2005, the first tablets came out that we actually could put windows on and be able to enter in data. When we look at the other problem, which is having patients coming in repeatedly for things that they really probably could do at home, then we have to consider smartphones. So the smartphone of the 80s was not really an MVP because I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember them, but they were oftentimes in a bag. They had very poor reception and um, my first data plan was 20 minutes. So there was no internet, it was just a, a phone. So we had to wait until 2007 when the first um, smartphone came out. Now we have an MVP, now we have something to work with, an interface where we can start sending data back and forth. The last thing is regulations. So we had to wait quite a while for regulations, but finally in, in 2013, which was about five years after Doug spoke to the FDA, um, we got some e-source guidelines from FDA, um, which seems like a really long time, but in government speak, they probably started working on it the second that Doug walked off the stage. <laughs> so um, there are a couple of really important things. So the first is they're looking at promoting, capturing data electronically. We can do that. They're also encouraging that we're capturing that data during the patient visit, which means that you are eliminating the transcription of all data into the EDC systems. EDC systems are electronic data capture systems. They're what you saw the person actually transcribing all of their information into on the computer. And that means that real time, we can look at data, a sponsor could see how things are going, which means they could potentially end a trial early um, if they needed to. And it also means that a monitor no, no longer has to go to that small room and stare at that shelf, but that they can actually monitor from the comfort of their own home and only go in for very specific tasks. Which means that we are able to really facilitate capturing complete and accurate data because now instead of a monitor saying, hey, you didn't get this information from three weeks ago, you have the ability for a tablet to say, hey, don't forget me, you got to fill this out before you let your patient go. So now we have supportive regulations. So really, if we think about it, clinical research, clinical trials are crucial for bringing drugs, biologics, and medical devices to the market. Almost every single um, drug, all drugs and biologics are, require clinical trials and a large majority of medical devices require clinical um, research in order to be able to be on the market. So we have that expensive, important problem. It's indirect. The problem's not necessarily clinical research. We know we got to have that. It's all the stuff that supports it. We have um, the existence of an MVP and MVS. We have innovation um, that might require invention, but it may just require a new way of looking at existing processes and tools. And we have a large market with supportive legislation. So we have a market for both the companies that are developing drugs and medical devices. We have a market for everybody out there who has ever taken a drug or medical device or has a condition and is still waiting for the right answer. And we have the government who is interested both for military use as well as civilian use, and they are also responsible for all of our regulations. So Clinical Inc's technology basically took all of that paper and turned it into a tablet. So now you walk in and you have a tablet given to you to fill out your information or the clinical research associate is filling out your information on a tablet, they get told, hey, you finished everything, you're good to go, or hey, you missed this, make sure you go back before you let the person go. And then you get an app on your, on your phone, you go home, you don't have to come in for every visit because suddenly you're just doing stuff on your phone. Your phone says, hey, you're supposed to finish something out today, let's go ahead and do that. So that's what Clinical Inc. has done. But I wanted to kind of go beyond what Clinical Inc. has done as well and think about all the other problems that we have in clinical research right now that are starting to have real innovation around them. 
So the first big problem is drug discovery is expensive. So as I mentioned earlier, it's about 12 to 15 years and it costs two to $3 billion to bring a drug to the market. Five in 5,000 drugs make it to a clinical trial and only one in five of those actually makes it to the market. Clinical trials are also super expensive. So the median price of a clinical trial is about $19 million. For drugs, they range from $2 million, which was for a four patient trial for a rare disease, to $347 million for a um, cardiac trial. Keep in mind that this is for one of the three phases of clinical trials that you have to go through. So you start with phase one, where you have a small number of people, you pass that, it takes about a year, you go back, you do a lot of research, you, do, you put together your protocol, you go through making everything again, you bring it all together, and then you go back to phase two. And then you're looking at about 100 to 300 people, it takes you about three years, and you go back, you do the exact same thing, and then you get to phase three. Phase three, you're looking at 1,000 to 3,000 people in three years. That's a problem. That means it takes a really long time to get a drug to the market. The third problem that we have is that new drugs are really expensive. Now, we can all kind of assume that some of what I just talked about is the reason that they're super expensive, but the drugs that we pay for are supporting um, all of the research and development. So they're supporting 75% failure rate back there. Um, and also we have a very long review time with FDA. A new drug application on average takes about two and a half years. And finally, healthcare is expensive. I think I can just leave that and everybody who's ever been to the doctor can agree with me on that one. So if we think about NVP and MVSs, let's think about drugs. So we have drugs that we need to get to clinical trials faster. So how are we going to do that? So there are a couple of new inventions that are really um, helping us to find druggable targets. So one of the um, items is looking at um, data mining. So starting to pull together a lot of people's data and digging through that and figuring out what are the targets that we need to be looking at. There are um, also, um, I can't read my hand, there's <laughs> genotypic and phenotypic screening. So we are looking at um, people, their DNA, and we're starting to really dig into what is the real problem. Is it something that, you know, is a genetic issue? Is it um, something in the blood that we can target? Is it a specific bacteria or virus that we can figure out some weakness in it that we can go target? Um, and then we're really looking at um, small discovery labs. So instead of the entire drug process going within one very large pharmaceutical company, we see these small pharma companies starting to do a lot of this mining and figuring out what might work. And then they're partnering with these very large pharma companies so that you're breaking apart the risk between two companies, which means that you also have two companies sharing the risk and sharing the profit. And that has become more and more prevalent. As we think about clinical trials and bringing human research into the 21st century, um, obviously we have the electronic source files and remote monitoring that I have mentioned, which significantly reduces the cost um, and the time of clinical trials because you can be monitoring that data um, in real time. So there was um, the largest type two diabetes um, clinical trial in the US, um, I actually, um, did some consulting with them and we started off, everyone was gung ho, it was gonna be fantastic. And they had several deaths happen um, and the entire clinical trial got shut down. There was a huge investment in getting that started. And if they had been able to have that real time data, we would have been able to identify that the reason was that they were actually keeping um, the blood sugar levels of their participants actually too tight to what we consider normal. And that was causing problems in their biology. The other thing is that we can look at virtual and at-home trials. So um, with the technology that Clinical Inc. has and interfacing with wearable technology like your smartphones, um, the Alexa devices, motion sen sensors, all that sort of thing, they can start doing a lot of stuff at home so that you never have to leave. Either you can do it without anybody at your house or you could have a nurse or a CNA come to your house, administer a couple of tests, throw it on a tablet and it goes in real time back for answers from the um, PI if you need a, a doctor's intervention, et cetera. Um, we're also really able to start incorporating 
uh, clinical trials into the medical setting. So we are able to use patient databases. <coughs> Whoop, bless you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we're really <laughs> assisting with targeted recruitment. And then we also have this new idea of these platform trials where we are looking at um, either umbrella or master protocols. So you have this large protocol that you're able to save money on all the setup and several different drugs are able to go under that, which really saves money. And it's all done under like partnerships through nonprofits so that several different companies who may technically be competing in the marketplace can suddenly come together and get their drugs to market faster and cheaper. What about drug costs? Mm, this one's a little maybe. Um, obviously, as I have discussed, drug discovery is really expensive, um, but we are having some improvements. So we've got the um, upcoming idea of omics, multi-omics, proteomics, all of that sort of thing is helping us really drive down to specific pathways that we can start to target and we can understand whether something's going to work much faster um, than we could before. Um, we also have FDA willing to start to support some faster tracks. So they have four tracks in uh, drug development. Um, and I'm going to speak sp specifically about priority review because priority review is an interesting one. So one of the issues that we have with drug costs is that if you have a rare disease, your drug is way more expensive than everybody else's because there's not many people that they can profit off with this drug. So one of the ways that FDA has combated this is that they are giving um, manufacturers who successfully get a rare disease drug through FDA, as long as they are um, identified and approved by FDA as such, um, they get this thing called a priority review voucher. Priority review vouchers are a really big deal because they mean that that two and a half year span goes down to months. So drug companies are willing to, to spend money on that. And finally, as we look at healthcare, we can now think about using clinical trials as a care option. Um, and so really you have um, electronic data systems that keep all of your medical records for those in the Forsyth County area. If you've been to the doctor recently, you have very likely interacted with a system called Epic. Um, and so we are starting to think about, can we have eligibility alerts within those systems that say, hey, this person has this disease, they don't have any of the exclusion criteria, they meet the inclusion criteria, you should talk to them. Um, and then we also have the, the ability to start really looking at participants in clinical trials as human beings. So instead of subject 165, 439, you're suddenly Joe on the street who has this disease, who has this data, and you're able to give this report to this person to bring to their physician to talk about when they get out. And you suddenly have a much more interactive experience learning about your disease while you're getting the, the drug or treatment. So we've, we've, got, we've got some good MVPs and some good MVSs. So what about market and regulation support? So as we think about drug discovery, um, our drug success, success rate has recently been quoted as being higher than we thought before. So now the belief is that we have about 14% of drugs um, in clinical trials actually make it to the market. So that's a really huge win. It seems really small, but that's a big deal. Um, and this is likely due to improved preclinical and clinical testing. Um, we also have the ability to do now what we call companion diagnostics, um, which is like a biomarker stratif stratif stratification, there we go, um, of subjects. So you have a blood test or a phenotype test. We determine whether we believe our drug's going to actually be effective for you, and then we include you in the clinical trial instead of just guessing you have a disease, we think it might work for you, um, which really improves the return on investment which means we're both faster and less expensive. And as I mentioned previously in licensing, those partnerships between these small drug development companies and these larger companies that have the funds to be able to bring something from the discovery of the drug all the way through a clinical trial, um, and those are starting to become more prevalent. I have a couple um, of examples up here um, that have happened within the last two or three years. Um, as far as clinical trials, we have the e-source um, that I have spoken of, and as well as remote monitoring. Both of those items are really starting to become much more mainstream. Um, and we also have those consortiums that we're building to be able to handle very large trials of drugs so that we are able to really reduce the startup costs, get to as many people as quickly as possible. As we think about drug costs, <clears throat> I mentioned those vouchers. 
And I, as an example, AstraZeneca recently bought a priority review voucher for $95 million, which would significantly offset the cost that, that the company that it bought it from um, in their investment in that rare disease um, drug development, which should help to reduce that cost. <clears throat> And then also FDA has recently released draft guidance on what they're calling seamless clinical trials. Um, this is specific to cancer drugs, but the belief is that if this is successful, it will be expanded to other um, drug categories. This is an idea where you have basically phase one bleeds into phase two, bleeds into phase three. So you just have extensions instead of having to start back over again reducing that time between each one of your phases and making drug coming to market faster or accelerating our failure, because really that's what we wanna do. We wanna knock out the things that aren't going to work as quickly as possible. And finally, healthcare. We have 8.5 of the US still remains uninsured. Um, we have people who have rare diseases with no solution. We have people who are undergoing traditional therapies for their diseases and it's not working. Um, we also have, importantly, these very large clinical research organizations that take the drugs from the drug companies and turn them into these clinical trials, buying into this idea of clinical trials as, trials as a care option, making it much more accessible to the community and making the community much more aware of the clinical trials. So, in summary, Doug, you want to join us for the, the in summary? So you're, you're much, you know, you can tell you have president and operations, <laughs> I think, as we talk. So I'm going to turn it over to you for sure. wrapping it up. So the question is, are you inventing or are you in a, innovating? Uh, clearly, there's overlap there. But when you think about perhaps your own foray into the uh, business world or if you're involved some, somewhere and we're thinking about how do I make this better, do I need an invention or uh, do I need to bring something new into an old pro process and make it, make it better? Um, we spend most of every day thinking about how we can make things better. I mean, innovation is, is, a, is a way of a business life. It's not something you do once a year, once a, a quarter. Um, are you addressing a real large expensive problem? Um, as Alexis made clear, the clinical research market addresses really important expensive things. Um, Bringing drugs to market costs a lot, and it's important because um, there's people, and there's people every day who, who uh, die, and their last hope they have is that something's going to emerge from clinical trials that can save their, their lives. So reducing the time spent in clinical trials means that people, you know, means that people are going to live. Um, I, guess, I guess it's actually written here, too. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, <laughs> Dan, uh, is there a large market and, and are there supportive regs? Um, at Clinical Inc., we were ahead of the curve for a long, a long time, and our ideas and our tech, technology struggled to gain hold primarily because the, the regulations that supported them weren't there, much like the crazy you know, uh, cityscapes when people are driving around in cars and bikes and horses. Without regs, um, even good ideas uh, can't really take it take hold. Again, as Alexis showed, in the clinical research market, the FDA um, and other regulatory groups have created an environment that encourages and supports uh, in innovation, smarter, better, faster ways to bring drugs to the market. I believe that's it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, just wondering, uh, where are you storing the data? It's a great thing to ask, and, and it's, a, it's a, critical, a critical thing. So um, data is collected at the sites. Um, it's encrypted. It's sent through a secure socket layer to a master server. Uh, the servers, depending on the study, are either lo located at various places around the world or located in a data center in the East U U U U.S. Um, the big issue about storing data is when and how and where you store personal identifying data, or P PHI, you know, personal healthcare in information. 
And in the United States, and especially in Europe, that is a huge deal. And uh, we often have to keep PHI in the re region where it was uh, tap captured in the first place. So uh, personal health care information that's um, entered into our devices in Europe has to stay in, in Europe. So we have to be able to do, do that. And does that mean if the lights go out or you get attacked by ransomware, we're in big trouble? Uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, ransomware, lights going out, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the risk of electronic data. Um, and we have to safeguard against the best, the best we, we can. I, I, we, we did a study at a research site in Knoxville, Tennessee, called the New Orleans Research something site. And I'm in Knoxville, and I asked the guy, why is this place called the New Orleans Research Site? He said, well, he said, well we were in New Orleans until Katrina hit, and we lost everything, because their paper data was very so securely locked up in one of these, like, you know, Fort Knox and, you know, kind of places, and Katrina flooded it, right? So paper-bound data or electronic data, you've got to safeguard that, that uh, data. We believe it's easy to do that with electronic data, but it's a very important part of what, you know, what, we, what we do. Great question. Other questions? Yes, sir. Please. Yes, please. I'm just wondering if you're trying to anticipate how, as the computers evolve, former means of data can't be read anymore. And if you're trying to anticipate that or what plans you have. Yeah, again, great thing to ask. And I can re recall being asked that by lots of folks. Like, so if you're storing data for four, 14 years, um, and you're storing it in a data database. Um, so let's say you're storing it in a, uh, you know, C SQL Server data data database. Twenty years from now, you're going to be at you know at version what what whatever. Can you even go back and read on that? So you really do have to be mi mindful of, um, of that. Um, a lot of data you know gets stored as a P P uh, PDF if it's not uh, live data because you know, the idea is a PDF is going to be readable for a long, long time. We used to send um, uh, data to the research sites on a DVD. Well, when you raise your hand, you own a computer that has a DVD drive in it. One person, <laughs> okay? One person. And they used to be totally common. Well, giving someone a DVD now is like giving them a rock. Like, you know, what, what, is, what is this? So we, you have to be aware of how you store data, how you can read read data. For a while, there was a, reg a regulation that stated that data had to be stored with the database, with the software required to run it. So you know, the version of the database has to be stored with it. We're responsible for not only saving the data, but allowing someone like the FDA to bring it up and, and, and it to be live. Any more questions? as a community college person, um, well, first off, I, I was very really intrigued with your entire presentation. Um, I'm going to be thinking about horse manure and <laughs> clinical trials for a long time, right? But as a community college, what can we do to help you either push this forward for your, your, your business or otherwise? Um, how can we be of value to you know, a local business here at Innovation Porter? So I, I actually think that there are um, a lot of components of our company that you wouldn't typically think of. So obviously there is a research component and we have individuals who have a history um, actually being in clinical sites um, who are able to read protocols and translate those. But beyond that, we also have computer programmers, we have data people, we have QC people, we have operations people, we have project managers, we have associate project managers. It is, you know, it seems like there's just this one um, tablet that's going out with some data, but behind that is a very diverse group of people. Um, and so I think, you know, the idea is really understanding that one track in your 
line of, of education does not mean that you end up there. I, we just hired a um, computer programmer um, who has a degree in Latin. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's educating um, students and giving them the skill set, not just um, specific to a, a particular line of work, but also teaching people how to learn so that you can continually innovate and, and adapt to the changing um, needs because you know we we've seen a, an incredible change in the needs um, and we've had somebody who's been with the company from the beginning who has adapted with every um, piece I think because she learned how to learn it's a great point learning learning how how to learn and learning how to think you know and I think uh, it's sometimes easy when you're in school to be so busy learning that you forget that what you really should be learning is how to think because what you're learning right here may give you some skills, but when you get out into the world, you're not gonna be asked the same things. Um, you're gonna be asked to take the ability that you've honed here and use it in a new setting. So being able to think, being able to write, being able to um, share your thoughts, and those are all critical skills that we look for when we, we hire. And the interesting thing about clinical research in this state is it's huge. Um, there's um, or organizations called contract research organiza organizations, C CROs. The two biggest in the world are in the state. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of opportunities to get into the clinical research world in this state. And as Alexis said, you know, you don't have to be doing pharmacological re research. There's jobs all over the place, and there's a lot of jobs you can get in on the ground floor and start and start like growing. So I, I think it's uh, it, it's a it, it's a good it's a good marketplace for uh, students in, in this in this state. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? I'm sorry. What's the program? Well, it depends on which system of ours <laughs> that you're using. Um, the new platform that we're using right now, we're building it on. React and React Native. Um, we, we use both relational databases and non. We're moving toward non. Um, so um, there's some really exciting technologies coming uh, to the fore. Um, the new platform we're, uh, build, we're building, for example, is going to be based on the AWS, Amazon Web Services stack. And so much of that technology is brand, brand, brand new. So the key, again, is not really which language you're learning, but your ability and willingness to take what you've learned and change, grow. You know, so maybe you haven't learned re React, but um, you can learn it. Maybe you, uh, you know C really well, C Sharp really well. If you can write good C Sharp code and you have the attitude, you can write code in any, any, anything. Uh, and it's, it's exciting. And for, for younger folks, and you've got these old guys um, I, I, I don't see any up here, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's old, old guys, and you know, their their skills are ancient. And the, the young people coming out of school know the new the new uh, tools, and, and they're able to, to use them and think in in an exciting way. So it's a great time to be in this in this field. Yes, sir. So we sell directly to pharmaceuticals like uh, Glaxo and Atsuka and Novartis and Merck. And then we also sell to these C CROs who pharmaceutical com companies hire to conduct their, their uh, trials. So we work with them, with, with, them, with them both. Any more questions? Thank you all. Drive safe, safely through the storm. Yes. Thank you. I'll just wrap us up with a couple of words and we'll get out of here. Sure. Uh, well, again, thank you. And like I said, awesome presentation. I was not expecting that. Uh, I want to thank you, Alexa, specifically for showing me the folder because I feel, I don't feel so alone now. I thought the community college is the only one that had a ton of paperwork. And it turns out that we are not the only ones that have that paperwork. Uh, and also, I just started reading a book, I think it's called New Work. I've only gotten to page three. <laughs> uh, 
But they talk about this organization and how you take down countries and how you take down corporations. So one of the things you do to take down a corporation, have triplicate signatures on all documents. Uh, that was developed in 1944 by the CIA. <laughs> Just saying. But that folder you showed, yeah, brings back a lot of memories. Uh, secondly, uh, just to let you know, because you know I do work here and I'm always closing, uh, we are offering, we are hiring Amazon to do an AWS class for us next spring, oh, a, a series of three. So uh, we'll let make, make sure you're aware and you can sign up for that if you like. And then uh, again, just thanks for being a partner with us. Thanks for coming out here tonight. I know the weather's awful, and if we can help with your success, call on Russ, and we'll get you guys straightened out. And here are a couple of, um, I guess you call them certificates. And where's the first one? Over here, Lexus. That's for you, and Doug, for you. Thank you. You're very welcome. I think we'll do a couple of pictures if you guys are up for that. Appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I appreciate you guys coming out there. Thank you. Nice it was great. Meeting you. Good meeting you. That was perfect. That was all. Uh, my my brother used to make drugs.